Blog Talk Radio. I'm going to a city that's set on a hill. Its ruler and maker is the Lord God above. Oh, I'm going to a city and it's set on a hill. And someday I'll be in heaven and there'll be no sorrow there. Oh, I'm going to a city and life for square. Hello, everybody. God bless you today. This is Susan Puzio. And I want to welcome you to the Prophetic News Radio broadcast on Blog Talk Radio. And we have a, a very, very special guest for you today, Brother Russell Kelly. And uh, he will be talking about tithing. He, he has a Ph.D. and uh, he did his dissertation on tithing. So he's very well versed on the subject, has spent many, many hours studying it. And I know you will be blessed because if we are going to be doers of the word, we have to know what the word says and uh, not what somebody told us that it says. So uh, I'm going to be bringing my guest on here, Brother Russell Kelly. Hello. Hello. How are you today? (laughs) Good. Good. (laughs) It's a great day. Beautiful. Uh, We're having some beautiful weather here today in Florida. Yes, we are here in Georgia. <laughs> oh, you're not too far away. Um, I I um, heard you on the uh, Church Folk Revolution radio broadcast, and I enjoyed it so much. I was so blessed <laughs> and uh, went over to your website um, and was blessed there also. Went over to YouTube and enjoyed the videos that you made over in England on Revelation TV. But uh, I wanted to ask you, how did you ever get interested in this subject of tithing? Well, I, I've told the story many times. When I was a, a child in Jacksonville, Florida, my dad had three jobs and uh, had the best Sunday school class in church and also had six children to raise. and. Uh, he was as proud as he could be of that Sunday school class to one day they came in and they took it away from him because he uh, was not paying enough money to the church. And it just set him on a downward spiral, and his life got worse and worse. He started drinking and eventually committed suicide. But oh, no. I just determined if I ever had a chance to study tithing that I would uh, look into it and, and defend my dad on that position. And uh, I did when my Ph.D. dissertation came up. The school uh, didn't take a, a stand one way or the other, but my the, the professor that did my dissertation agreed with me, and the and the uh, head of the school the uh, <laughs> did not agree with me. But they said that my work qualified, the research I did qualified for the PhD. Wow! And from that came my book, "Should the Church Teach Tithing," and uh, it's been out since 2000, and. Uh, Done pretty good. Uh, it's only on the internet, but it's still there, and it's usually in the top ten or eleven, twelve on Amazon under yeah. tithing. Yeah, Charisma <laughs> Magazine hasn't offered to publish it for you. <laughs> I wish they would. <laughs> I wish they would. Have uh, you they seen mentioned it, over it there? one time. It they mentioned the it end? one time on the first page of their uh, website, their internet website. Oh, did they? Yes, they did. <laughs> oh, wow! So they are. Aware. See, I was. Yeah. CBS News came out to my house and did an interview, and they, and they made a show out of it called The Tithe or Not the Tithe. Yeah, on I Sunday saw CBS. that. And uh, after that hit, I get everybody in the world started mentioning my book and my article on their websites. <laughs> Usually uh, negative, but, that, you know, n- n- uh, any news is better than no news. <laughs> well, the thing is, uh, it, to me, it's amazing that it would be negative because if they really – read what you're saying it would be obvious that it is the truth mm-hmm. but um, uh, I myself was a word of faith person for many years uh, from about 1981 to 1995 and uh, I, I firmly believed in tithing because I followed Kenneth Hagan and Kenneth Copeland and all those people 
And uh, so, but I, I purposed in my heart that I was going to find out for myself, and I spent about three months studying every scripture on giving and tithing and free will and offerings, and I, and I came to find out what you found out doing your study. So it, it didn't make me popular in the circles that I traveled in either, but it, it would be... Uh, it would be a big step forward for Charisma Magazine uh, with all those heavy, heavy hitters they have there that teach tithing to uh, publish your book or even to do more publicity about it because that would be an interesting debate to debate someone like uh, Kenneth Copeland or uh, Rod Parsley. I would take him up any day. <laughs> yes. Amen. It, uh, it's the easiest thing in the world to study. All you need to open up a concordance and look up every word, every word tithes. And by the time you've done that, you've, you've studied everything the Bible says about it. Yeah. And just make a list of what each text says. And and like I said in my book, there's 16 texts that mention the words that describe the contents of the holy tithe. And they're always only food from inside Israel. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> If there's 16 out of 16 verses that describe the contents of the tithe that way, then that must be the contents of the tithe. <laughs> and, and everybody says, well, what about Abraham's tithe? Well, in the first place, uh, the Bible doesn't tell us why Abraham tithe. In the second place, it, it is clear that that which he did tithe was, was from pagan property, and none of that would have ever been allowed into the temple as a holy tithe. Yes, he tithed, but why did he tithe? And, and it wasn't it wasn't a holy tithe. It was just something. I'm convinced he was obeying the law of the land. And I'm not making that up. You, you, there's all kinds of of, of uh, other non-biblical sources that prove that in those days, if if you had spoils of war, you were required to but, but by the law of the land to give it to the local king priest. Oh, so that's all we see in Abraham. Yeah. But so uh, uh, the. Uh, the order of Melchizedek. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's another big one. Who was Melchizedek? Stick, stick that in your in your search engine in under uh, a biblical concordance, and you'll see that the word Psalms 110:4 says, "Thou art a thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek." Is quoted. That text is quoted seven or eight times in Hebrews, and nowhere else. Well, what happens? David is trying to find. You know, by inspiration, trying to find a type of Christ in the Old Testament, and you know, before him, and he couldn't find a person, but he found an order. It, the text, the Bible, never says that Christ is a priest after the person of Melchizedek. He's only a priest after the order. In other words, that part of Melchizedek, which is a type of Christ, is not his person; it's his rank in society as a king priest. Yeah. Now, what Hebrew says that seven times. He's a priest not after the person of Melchizedek because the person is irrelevant in the, in the typology. Yeah. Uh, uh, Hebrew 7.1 says uh, that, Christ, that, that Melchizedek was a Christ by interpretation of his name. Well, that's not true of Jesus. Jesus is the king of righteousness whether you interpret his name or not. Yeah. But, but Melchizedek in, in Genesis 14 was only a type of Christ by interpretation of his name, which ought to tell anybody he wasn't Christ. A lot of people thought he was. And it said after the similitude of, Mel, you know, of Melchizedek. So the word, of course, Mel, Melchi means king. Zedek means righteousness. Uh, to, a, to a first century uh, Canaanite, though, Melchi meant Moloch. MLK could be Malek, Moloch, or Melki. Oh. MLK was also the name for Moloch. That's how you write Moloch in Hebrew. MLK. Oh. <laughs> and wow. Zedek, if you if you look up Melchizedek in the Encyclopedia Britannica, it, it will tell you that Zedek is, is also the Canaanite name for Jupiter. And oh. it's, it's all over the internet. Just put in Zedek and Jupiter, and you'll see a thousand articles about it being Jupiter. So it depends on who you're asking. In Genesis 14, if you ask a Hebrew, who is Melchizedek, they'll say, well, that's the king of righteousness. That's God, Yahweh. But if you ask a Canaanite, they will say, oh, that's Moloch, the, the, the righteous judge. <laughs> uh -oh. It's all a study of, it's a study of typology. Yeah. 
So I've never heard it put that way. That was that was a really good explanation. It, 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 if you want more details, go to my book on on uh, my entire book is on my website in the left hand column, and okay. read the chapter on Hebrews seven. Okay. Now I was also very interested in uh, you going over to um, London to uh, Revelation TV. Now, how yes. did you get invited? How did they invite you there? Well, a friend of mine wanted it so bad that he he told Revelation TV that that he would uh, you know cover the expenses of me coming there if they could find somebody to debate with him. And uh, they wanted it because they always are having debates. Revelation TV, they have them on every subject you can imagine, and they thought tithing would be an interesting debate. Well, they couldn't. It took them forever to find somebody who would debate. <laughs> yeah, well, do and you know thing, who they asked? Because I know some of the heavy hitters there. Well, Did they I'm ask sure they, uh, Colin Dye? I don't know, I don't know particular, specifically, but I know my friend probably asked everybody in town. Yeah. And they all turned him down. Yeah, because there's some uh, there's some very large churches there in London. I I personally uh, spent uh, from '91 till 1997. I I took over 30 uh, trips to London and uh, used to speak in many of the churches there and at some conferences and women's conferences and different things. So I'm quite familiar with London. I'm I'm amazed that they had you there. Uh, but I'd like to see some of those heavy hitters debate you. I would love to hit, debate anybody there or here. Yeah, so <laughs> no, he no heavy, heavy hitter in the United States will debate me either. Yeah. Uh, I'd like well, to go back to London. I'd like to go back and see if we could have a, about you know a whole week on the subject, rent a hall somewhere, yeah. and uh, just really debate it all week long if, oh, if somebody yeah. wanted to. Well, uh, you could I would do have, that. Yeah. Well, I would absorb most of the cost, and maybe we could charge a little fee or something. But it, 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 it it's expensive going there, flying there, and dying. Oh yes, it's very expensive. It's expensive to stay there too. Uh, yeah, Ten-hour plane trip too. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, it's horrible that plane trip. And uh, for the most part, you have to fly at night, and so then you're up all night, and you get mm -hmm. there in the morning. And when you get there, you're you're just takes you a couple of days to get uh, get your head together. But yeah, that would be great because um, they I you know I was very glad that they had you. But like you said, the person you debated, he really wasn't debating you. He just basically was saying the same thing over and over again about the principle. Well, mm -hmm. Now, what does he mean when he was he kept saying the principle of tithing? Well, it, if you look up the word a principle is something, what he means is an eternal moral. I really didn't get into it. He means tithing is an eternal moral principle. But the way I understand the word of God, it's, an eternal moral principle is something that's written within the heart and conscience and nature of every person. Like we all know it's wrong to kill and steal and commit adultery, right? Yeah. That's written within our being. You know, Romans 4, 2 says, For when the Gentiles who have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, them having not the law are a law unto themselves, their conscience bearing witness. That's an eternal moral principle. It, the, the, we all know we should give. That's an eternal right. moral principle. Right. But to say we should give a ten percent of the first fruits of our income—that's nowhere written in the heart and conscience and nature of any man. Yeah. So it's not. It's not giving is a principle. Tithing is not. Yes. Right. You know, it, it's it's kind of foreign when you tell people, you tell Christians. Uh, they want to know, well, why are you against giving? And you try to explain to them the nature of a Christian when you're born again. You know you're supposed to give. It's in your heart. The, exactly. the biggest giver it's in the world. Part of your lives. new nature in Christ. Yes. The biggest giver in the world lives inside of you. So God so loved the world, he gave. And the, the principle of, of giving is to give out of love. But I noticed even some of the people that... Uh, uh, had comments during your interview there at, in London, it always went back to selfishness. It went back to, well, I tithed, and then when I tithed, I got something in return. I got a house, I got a job, and, it, and it's all based on selfishness. 
So uh, but, it's not true Christian giving. The only person that gives these testimonies are asked to go up front and give them. The, uh, the, other, uh, the other 19 out of 20 people who tithe and are not blessed physically or financially, they don't give their testimonies. Yeah. You only hear the <laughs> success stories. Uh, what, uh, people are always quoting Psalm 24.1, you know, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills and everything is his. Well, that was true in the Old Testament, but even then, even though that was part of the Old Testament and that was true in the Old Testament, the tithe could still only come from God's holy land. See, the idea was that God, the land of Canaan was God's holy land. And the tithe had to come off of what was already holy. And, and to go further, it had to come off of what God increased. That, why, that's why it could only be food. You can plant something and have a cow, but you can't, make, you can't reproduce them. They have to reproduce under God's blessings, right? Yes. There, therefore, the increase that was tithe had to be something that God increased and not man. That way man could never say, God, you owe me something because I gave you a tithe off of something I yeah. made. Yeah, but that's and how Nobody people, goes that far. <laughs> well, that's how people basically look at it. I always felt like, well, if I give this money, then God's obligated to give it back to me. Not only that, he's obligated to give it back to me more he has to give me more than I gave. And well, that's called that was, extortion. <laughs> yes, it's called extortion, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But uh, anyway, it is, this is a live call-in program, and if you'd like to call in, I know we had a caller, and I see that you hung up. But anyway, the call-in number is 914-338-1638, and you can call in your <coughs> questions. And mm -hmm. uh, the chat room is open, too, so you can... If you have any questions there, please feel free to call in. But, um, okay, you say that the tithe was always food, and, of course, we know one, the favorite book of all the tithe teachers is the book of Malachi. So what, what are they really talking about in the book of Malachi? Well, Malachi, Malachi was written a thousand years after uh, Leviticus 27 and Numbers 18, where the tithe was first defined as food. And in Malachi 3.10, the verse everybody quotes, bring you all the tithes in the store. I said there may be food or meat for my team, you know. And, and it, it's still only food. <laughs> bring you all the tithes that there may be meat in my storehouse. Meat means yeah. food. Right. So it's still only food in the verse they quote. And then they'll turn around and say, oh, that means the first fruits of your income. Well, in the first place, Malachi is only addressed to Israel under the Old Covenant, and we are New Covenant Christians. In the second place, uh, Malachi is really, really specifically addressed to dishonest priests who have been stealing. Yeah. If you read chapter 1, verse 6, chapter 2, verse 1, God has already cursed the priest four times before he gets to Malachi 3. Why well, would he be <laughs> cursing the priest and all of a sudden feel sorry for the priest? I know when I when I read when I finally read the whole book of Malachi, I saw that, and it's then I realized I, I was being lied to. They were telling me I was going to be cursed if I didn't give them money. Okay, here's a text that I want all your listeners to write down: Nehemiah ten, thirty-seven and thirty-eight, and Numbers eighteen, twenty-one to twenty-eight. Nehemiah 10, 37, 38, Numbers 18, 21 to 28. The, the people were commanded to bring their tithes not to the temple but to the Levitical cities because that's where 98% of the people who needed the tithes for food lived. Wow. It, let's say you lived in Orlando and, uh, and the, the, the temple of God in Florida was in Jacksonville, and every time you got hungry, you had to go to Jacksonville. Would you like that at all? No. See, it makes no sense. Right. Bring ye all the tithes in the storehouse is telling the priest to bring the tithes back to the storehouse, which they had taken out of it in Nehemiah 13.5. The, see, these two books happen at the same time. Nehemiah yeah. goes back to Persia, and while he's gone, they, they empty the storeroom. It wasn't a storehouse. It was two large rooms, about 10 by 20. They empty those storerooms, which says where the tithe had been kept, and they let Tobiah move in. Well, the priest didn't have anything to eat, and it says that the priest went back, I mean the Levites, because the priest had the tithe. They just moved it somewhere else. They stole it well, from the Levites. Well, who were the Levites? The Levites who received the tithe were the servants to the priest. They received the whole tithe, 
and they only gave the priest a tenth of what they received. That's not done today either. Yeah. But the Levites, the Levites were the were the animal skinners. They were the janitors. They were the singers. They were the trumpeteers. They were the guards. They did everything except minister the blood. They received the tithe. Now, if you did that today, you would give your tithe to the ushers, the deacons, the uh, the choir members, the treasurer, the, and you wouldn't give it to the preacher. Would he would only fun. get a tenth of it. <laughs> yeah, that would be fun. Yay. I am not making this up. Oh, and, and then, yeah, amen. No, he's and not then, making and this they, up. And then they call the tithe the first fruits. Well, that is never true. In the Bible it never calls the tithe the first fruits. Well, the what first is fruits, first fruits? First fruits, if you, okay, look this up in Nehemiah 10, 35, 36, and 37, and okay. Deuteronomy 26, verses 1 to 4. Okay. Yeah, I know these by heart. I remember. <laughs> the first fruit was a token offering. If you had a crop full of apples, you'd go out there and pick one or two and send it to God for a first fruit. It was not a tithe. It was a token offering, a very, very small token offering at that. Uh, because the Alfred first Edishai first Nathan, was never money. It was never money. Even, even if it was, it's only a few pennies out of a dollar, but it's, it wasn't never money either. Yeah. There, there's a text in Timothy, First, uh, first Timothy 5, 8, that says, If any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house. He has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Yeah. That's what Christians are when they give their tithe, the ten, first 10% of their paycheck to a church and then go home and have no, no money to pay food, electricity, and take care of their basic needs for their family. They are become they have become worse than an infidel. They're yeah. giving the money. They, it's sort of like uh, Jesus talked about Corban. This money, which should go to take care of my parents, is now going to the church. And I'm going to say, Corban, it's a gift to God. My parents can't not get it. They can starve to death for all I care. That's why Jesus taught against Corban. What is Corban? Paying a tithe. Huh? Paying pay a tithe? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I, I see no difference. I see no difference. Yeah. Well, that's absolutely true. I mean, I've been there myself where I sacrificed and I sacrificed and I sacrificed and uh, and God had to really get my attention and show me what I was doing and what I was doing was wrong and uh, I had to repent. I had to repent because, of course, most of the churches where I was going to preach were word of faith churches, and they all taught tithing. And so I couldn't, once I realized tithing was wrong and I was going to tell people it was wrong, well, then they don't want you to come into their churches and say that. So uh, they don't invite you, and uh, you're basically shunned. You, you said you were shunned even from the Southern Baptist Convention. Now, that's odd. Oh, yeah. Church, church at about six different churches just, as soon as they found out my position on tithing, I didn't want nothing to do with me. And, and the funny thing is, they, a few years ago, they took a survey uh, in their Facts and Trends magazine. They yeah. took a survey of their own preachers, and 20%, that's one out of five of their own preachers, said in that survey, they do not teach tithing. And I'm just, I'm, I keep asking, like, where are these 20%? They're out, they never stand up and, and defend it or speak up. Where are they? They will say that in the survey, but they won't say it from the pulpit. Yeah. Well, most people won't say it from the pulpit. There's very, very few people that you hear uh, really teaching the truth. And then most people that go to church don't read their Bibles, and uh, they just believe everything that the preacher tells them. So, uh, but, yeah. you know, the Bible says that God doesn't want us to be ignorant. And uh, so now also in the Old Testament, I, I noticed some scriptures where they talk about giving out of a willing heart. I think some of those scriptures are in Exodus, maybe well, Numbers. The, the, when they first built the tabernacle, the tent, everything in it was paid for with free will offerings. No tithing, never paid for it at the sanctuary. Yeah. When, they built the, when they built Solomon's temple... 
It was all built by free will offerings. Not one tithe was ever used to build that building. And the, the tithe was only to support the Levitical priesthood and the priests, the Levites and the priests. Uh, not one tithe. Here's, I, I like to point this out because everybody said we need to give tithes so we can support missionaries. Show me anywhere in the Old Testament where a tithe was ever used to build a mission station to try to convert the Gentiles. <laughs> it, it's, you know, it's never. <laughs> never. So if you don't have a precedent in the Old Testament, how can you say tithes are to use to support missionaries? The New Testament teaches that giving should be, first of all, free will, and then generous and especially sacrificial. Everybody should, uh, it should give sacrificially. So, to some people, that means more than 10%. Yes. Yeah. I always say give until you actually notice it. It may be 20, 30, 40 percent until you actually notice it hurts your income. That's giving sacrificially. So a lot of Christians can give more than a tithe and, and don't because they, they, think they, feel full, they think they've fulfilled their obligation. At right. the same time, some people are, are giving sacrificially when they're only giving 1 or 2 percent. or They have nothing left to give. Yeah. How can you go to a person on disability with small children to take care of and living off a of government pension and expect them to tithe off of their Social Security and welfare check? Yeah. Yet that's done in every church of the land. Yes, it is. People yes. are expected to give tithes off their Social Security. That is criminal, in my opinion. Well, Those it is criminal. I mean, he just jail. talked about that, didn't he, when he was telling off the, the Pharisees and he called them... You, you're full of extortion and excess. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's what we're seeing today because uh, they, they tell people, and, and now they tell them, borrow it on your credit card. And they're actually telling them now to go into debt so that they could give them mm -hmm. their money. They've even mm -hmm. set up uh, credit card kiosks in the churches where you can go in and you can swipe your credit card to pay your tithes. I just this this generation scares me. Yeah, it's it's really really true. It does. It, it is does, very does anybody very read, frightening. You know, does anybody read Acts 15? Paul comes back from his missionary journey, and all of a sudden the Pharisees are jumping all over him, saying, "Now look, we hear that you're not making the Gentiles who are saved uh, keep the law," and uh, and the, the church made a compromise, which was wrong. I mean, the, the, the Bible correctly uh, records the, what they said that was what they said, but it, it doesn't – what they said was wrong. James, speaking for the church, says, okay, here's, here's my compromise. When you lead a Jew to the Lord, you have to teach him to keep the law. But when you lead a Gentile to the Lord, you don't have to teach him to keep the law. That's what's taught in Acts 15, and it was wrong. And Paul knew it was wrong, and he went out and ignored it anyway. But we've always heard a saying. When I said this on, on Church Folks Revolution, you could hear the you could hear the people falling on the floor. I said, I want to tell you something. All my life, I have heard and I have taught myself that we are to say, I am no longer under the law. Well, I got news for you. That's wrong. The truth is, I never was under the law to say I am no longer under the law. Paul could say it because he was a Jew. I yeah. cannot say I am no longer under the law as a Gentile because I never was under it. Yes. And when I said that, it got real quiet, and all of a sudden they started screaming and hollering. They beat their little gongs, <laughs> and that's great. <laughs> it yeah. was something else. Yeah, well, I've never heard that before either, you know, that I, because we were taught that, that we were under the law. I know it. Law. And well, James, I know he's listening, but James wrote his, his little his little article to me. He, he mentioned two or three times in one paragraph that we are no longer under the law. And I figured he's going to be surprised to find out we never were under it. <laughs> yes, yes. But you, you're you led to believe that, that you were under but the law. God gave the law to Israel. This is in Exodus 19, 5 and 6, to make them a peculiar people above all nations. And then he says later on, don't you dare share your covenants with any other nation. He, that law was a wall between Israel and the rest of the world. God did not give the law to anybody but Israel. The yes. rest of the world were under the law of conscience and nature. Yes. And we have got that whole concept mixed, so mixed that we, don't, we act like we're under the law. What part of the law are you under? Well, I've gotten rid of most of it. I'm just under tithing. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. That's the only thing is that you know, we shudder uh, 
we're so afraid of God that if we don't put that 10% in the offering at the storehouse, which is you're taught is the local church, if you don't give that money there, then you're so afraid of God that uh, he's going to curse you and then you're not going to have enough money to pay your bills and you won't have a car and you won't have a house. And uh, it's all based on fear. And for some reason, people have it in their head that they have to give God money. And I, I say, well, what does God need money for? He doesn't need any money. We give money mm. to each other. We're not giving it, giving the money to God. He doesn't need well, it. it. Well, Paul quoted in, in Galatians 3.10 that, you know, if, if you want to be under the law, you have to keep all of it. Cursed is he that obeyeth not every, you know, the whole law. You can't say, God, you owe me a blessing because I have tithed. Uh, when you had broken uh, uh, about uh, 400 other parts of the law. Yes. The only way you could claim a blessing was to keep the whole law. Yes. And even, even Malachi says that in chapter 4, verse 4. It says these are the commands. You are to keep the whole law, the, the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments. Now, another one of their favorite verses is, and I will open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. There'll not be room enough to receive. Yep. What's the context? Food. Yeah. <laughs> Rain. It, and I say, well, how many of you people who have been tithing all of your life can claim that it, it has actually, God actually done that too? Yeah. Most people say, I've been tithing, I've been doing it without, and I'm still doing it without, and sooner or later my money tree is going to come in. Yeah. That's a selfish motive. We shouldn't tithe to get to go so God will bless us. Yes, right. When when he says, test me in this, he's not saying, you keep the tithe, you tithe and I will bless you, and it's all right to go ahead and murder and steal and commit adultery. You can, you can break those laws, but as long as you tithe, you're testing me in the tithe, and I'm going to bless you. That's yes. hogwash. Yes. God don't do that's not That's not the Old Testament concept of the law. If you read Nehemiah ten twenty nine, they had just renewed that covenant, and the whole nation of Israel. This, these are this is uh, Malachi's audience is in Nehemiah. In Nehemiah ten twenty nine, they renewed the covenant, saying, "If we don't keep all of the law, we want you to curse us." That so the, the, you can't tithe and be blessed and break the rest of the law. Yes. Yeah. We are to be blessed by new covenant principles. Yes, and uh, we uh, the Bible says to ask and you shall receive. So, oh, we have, <laughs> if we need something from from God, we pray and we ask for it. We don't, you know, bribe Him. <laughs> see, see if you got any callers. <laughs> <laughs> no, there is there, there isn't a caller. We had one, but for some reason they didn't stay on. They only stayed on for about two minutes, but. Anyway, if someone would like to call in, I'll repeat the number again. It's 914-338-1638. So uh, you're welcome to call in your questions if you have any questions, and I'm sure you do. Uh, most people do, and uh, they have their certain tithing positions. But I, I noticed, too, when you were um, – your uh, YouTube videos. Now, do you have your own YouTube channel where your YouTube videos are available from the videos you did with Revelation TV? No, but they're all under there. If you don't see all of them under uh, Revelation TV, look under robfox.com. Okay. Uh, he has a, He's put them in a lot better order. Uh, if you go on the first page of my website, they're also um, in three different videos by Vimeo. Uh, so several people have done uh, – Rob Fox does the Revelation TV best. He's got them all in order, and the Revelation TV videos tend to leave parts out. Oh. So I just see. go to uh, Tithing Debate Revelation TV and, and go to the one made by Rob Fox. Yeah. He's, so one, these he's one of my best friends. Oh. So now these videos actually – I mean, this uh, – these programs, these videos that you did with Revelation TV, they were actually broadcast on uh, television in London? Oh, they go all over Europe. Revelation oh. TV is... Oh, uh, yes. That, they, they have a... And they broadcast them numerous times. That wasn't the only time. Wow. And so it, we do have a caller. That's amazing that they did that. Uh, I'm 
Well, I've met the really, people there at Revelation TV, and they're very quite. Matter of fact, uh, uh, I don't know if he wants me saying this, but Doug Harris, the moderator, and, and several others there, basically, they were glad that I was there, and they agreed with me. At least that's what oh, they that's, said to my face. Wow. <laughs> that's a blessing. Yeah. I didn't know them this when is I the, was there. I'm going to bring most, this caller on the air. Okay. Hello, caller. Hello, Susan. This is Vincent. Hi. Hey, Hi, Vincent. Hey, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> good. Thanks for calling in. Do you have a question or a comment for Russell? Yeah, yes, I do have a question. Um, uh, as we can see in the scriptures, we know that uh, tithing was about food and everything. When did it become about money? <laughs> much, I mean, much later than the scriptures. Uh, some of the, if you uh, read the, I've got, I, I've taught the history of the Christian of tithing in the Christian church. Uh, around uh, A.D. 250, a gentleman named Cyprian tried to introduce it into the church, and even then it was only money, and it was split between everybody, everybody in the church. But it didn't take hold. Uh, around the middle of the 6th century, around 545, 80, there were two local church conferences that tried to, to incorporate tithing, in, but then it was only money. Uh, later on, around uh, Charlemagne the Great, around 800, it tried, uh, was the first one to make tithing a law, but it was money, it was still only food then. It doesn't become money until, <laughs> until after the AD 800. And it goes out in some of the uh, the early English tithing laws. It's 1600, 1400, seven, it was only food. So it became money much, much later than probably around after 1600. Uh, even during the height of the Middle Ages, during Catholicism, uh, it, the tithe was a food. As a matter of fact, that's why most Jews have gone into banking. They, they, the church owned the land. They rented it out. And the Jews would live on land owned by the church, and they would they would grow food on it, and they didn't want to have to give a tenth of that food to the Catholic Church, so they they got out of farming and went into banking because the church did not tax tithe money. They did not require that. So if, it's funny why we have so many Jews in banking today, and it has it goes right back to the problem of tithing being a food item at that time. Uh, yeah, because so I, I, it's hard I, I to realized put. The, the, the thing that got me out of it was, um, you know, when you look back in history, even the uh, great preachers and everything, you never hear about that talked about until about the 20th century. And um, that that's one thing that opened my eyes to it because I was like, wait a minute, you know, uh, when the founding fathers were here and uh, whatever, you never heard them talking about uh, tithing that much, you know, and basically what I know about tithing, I've heard only in the 20th and the 21st centuries, but, you know, mostly you, you don't hear about it before then, you know, too much because, you know, I, I don't know, maybe someone just decided, okay, well, you know, our churches are run down and I guess we need to throw this uh, tithing thing at people so that they'll give so the churches can get beautified and whatever and stuff like that. So, I mean. Yeah, real, real beautified. Some are 50 million, 90 million. But, Russell, did, do you know when uh, or who started teaching tithing in America? I'll tell you a brief history. I've got an article on, on my website. Uh, the, the gentleman, uh, if you watch the, uh, the uh, CBS News special on tithing, he's interviewed there. He's the head of the theology department in Knoxville. It's a Methodist, a Methodist school, I think. But he did a, a book on it, In Search of, you know, In Search of the Almighty Dollars, the name of the book. Oh. Uh, the, the, the churches that were state churches like Germany and England, uh, they started making it money. But when the United States was founded, when people came over here, uh, the early churches, uh, you know, 1600, 1700, 1800, were supported by uh, the government. If you, if you lived in a town and had a church, the taxes of the whole town would pay for that church. So there was no need to teach tithing. You were, you were supported by the government. But when the United States government passed the, the what is that, the, one of the amendments to the Constitution that 
separated church and state. Yes, not. yes. They had to so find actually, other because there's people that teach there what there is no separation of churches. Okay, now what they did then was they started renting churches out the pews, and uh -huh. some churches still do that. Well, around 18, this is this is all in 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 the book called In Search of the Almighty Dollar. Around 1870. Uh, the churches were still looking for source of the money, and, and they, they had a, uh, essays pr submitted from all around the world on suggestions on how to support the church. Well, some of those essays suggested tithing. So they, uh, from around 1870 to 1895, these essays were battered back and forth and discussed. And uh, by the year 1900, tithing became the end thing in, in the United States. In 1895, the Southern Baptist Convention first suggested it. As a matter of fact, I've got the, the article from the New York Times on my website. And oh. the, the convention suggested it to the people, and the people voted it down. Oh. <laughs> That's 1895. It, it, they didn't yeah. think it was biblical. Well, in the 1920s, <laughs> listen to this. This gets even better. And if you go to the Southern Baptist Convention's own website and go under Faith and Message and, and say the history of their doctrinal position, in yeah. 1925, the doctrinal position on stewardship does not mention the word tithing and does not list any text under stewardship that, quote, tithes. Well, by 1963, uh, the word tithe is still not mentioned, but all of the texts are there that, quote, tithing. So yeah. they have... Between 1925 and 1963, they, they put in all these tithing texts, and the next step will be to mention the word tithe itself in their statement of faith, but their statement of faith still does not contain the word tithe. Wow. So that's the evolution of the Southern Baptists. And I haven't traced the other churches. Uh, since the, uh, what was the Azusa Mission, was not 1900? Yeah, somewhere around oh. there, yeah. Uh, I would like for somebody to go back and, and find me their original statement of faith, but uh, since it was after 1895, it probably does mention tithing, but I'm guessing it does not. Yeah. <laughs> you, have you investigated the Assemblies of God, uh, their original statement of faith, you know, if it included tithing? Well, they have all come in after 1895, and they do. They do yeah. teach tithing. Yeah. But when they do I that, they change they change the definition from food to money. They change the definition from inside the Holy Land of Israel to anybody. They change the application. Instead of going to the Levitical servants of the Lord, they give it to the church, and the church some, some churches use it to support the preachers, and some churches use it to, to pay all the bills. So, like I said in the debate in London, nothing that the church teaches about tithing today is biblical, not one yes. single thing. No. Yeah, and I'm waiting for them to show me where I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, they'll twist the scriptures and everything and say, "Well, it's a scandal." This, this, yeah, it, it it really is. Be and it it it. I I just got my eyes open up to it about two years ago, and uh, it, it it's funny because I was on YouTube and this brother who was not a Christian really opened my eyes to it, and I was like, you know what, you know, it got you to thinking, and you know, this is why it's so good to. Uh, know your Bible and study your Bible because, you know, you get to thinking, you're like, wait a minute, you know what? This Russell, he, you know, he knows what he's talking about because I didn't see that in the Bible either, you know, about, you know, uh, uh, tithing and sowing seeds and all that crazy mess and everything. And I was like, and, and, and it, it, it just popped your eyes open and you're like, well, no, you know, I'm sitting here thinking that, you know, the curse is going to be lifted off of me because I'm giving my tithe and everything, <laughs> and, you know, and that you're going to reap a financial harvest and all this stuff. And and I'm like, wait a minute. You don't see that anywhere in the Bible. And, you know, and, and they have they have some kind of excuse to cover all bases. Like if you say, if you come to them and say, well, I've been paying my tithes, I've been paying my offerings for 20, 30 years, well, yeah. don't speak, don't speak now, don't speak that, don't speak that, you know. Because that and, money tree is coming in any day now. Yeah, yeah it, oh. it, it's coming in any day. And I'm like, well, <laughs> if if I'm supposed to be, you know, getting a financial harvest so, you know, God can take care of me and everything and stuff like that, why does it have to wait 25 to 30 yeah. years for that to come in? I mean, I know. <laughs> I'm still you know, waiting. So. Yeah, yeah, I get I'm, so, I'm still waiting on mine too. <laughs> yeah, I get so upset when they say, "Well, Jesus taught tithing, therefore tithing is taught in the New Testament." Well, we may call it the New Testament, but the New Testament doesn't begin until Jesus says on the cross, "It is finished." Yeah. Exactly. 
And, yep. and when, when Jesus is saying, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, he's not addressing the Christian church. He's, described, he's addressing scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and he, he said, you tied mint and cumin. Oh, they were still tied in only food. We want to right. listen to that part of the text. Right. And you will, you uh, dis, dis, uh, you ignore the weightier matters of the law. Well, they act like that word matters of the law is not even in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Jesus is not discussing matters of grace to the Christian church. He's discussing matters of the law to those who are breaking the law. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. the verse itself can be destroys their own argument. Yeah. yeah. I don't know <laughs> if you ever heard uh, heard this one, because um, I've heard this taught. Uh, you know, when Jesus says, except your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, I've heard it taught that your righteousness exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees because you have to, they, they say, well, what was the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees? Well, they paid tithes. So that means you got to give, you know, a seed or something like that and everything. And I'm like, that, I don't see that in that scripture, you know, that you have to do, you know, some, some would say you have to do more than the tithe. You know, uh, some, some, some places you, you have to pay it's a 15% basic minimum tithe. minimum given. The, uh, Randy Alcorn teaches that. The training wheels, the beginning place, the standard, they have all these words, and none of them come yeah. from the Bible. None of them now, come the, from the Bible. The Bible teaches that the only people who were required to give a minimum of 10% were food producers who lived inside Israel, period. Yeah. Therefore, it was not a minimum for everybody in the world. It wasn't even a minimum for people in Israel who were not food producers. Jesus yeah. was a carpenter. Peter was a uh, fisherman. Paul was a tent maker. None of those qualified if they lived inside Israel as a tithe payer. Yeah. They had no food to tithe. What mm -hmm. about the scripture uh, where in the Old Testament, I can't remember exactly, it might be in Numbers or Deuteronomy, but uh, where it says that at, at every three years you can take your tithe and you can sell it and then spend spend the money on whatever your soul lusts after. Mm -hmm. I don't hear anybody ever no, quote no, no, that, that one. No, <laughs> no that, you're misquoting it. <laughs> <laughs> there was there was three tithes in the Old Testament. The first was the Levitical tithe that went to the Levitical cities, and the Levites shared a tenth of that with the priest. The second tithe was a festival tithe that was brought to the streets of Jerusalem three times a year during the festivals and eaten by everybody. Now, if, if you didn't have a, a wagon and a horse cart and didn't have any way of carrying that food to Jerusalem, you were allowed to convert the tithes into money, and when you got to Jerusalem, turn it back into food and eat it. So the, yeah. the, second, tithe, the second tithe was eaten by the people in the streets of Jerusalem. Wow. Now, there was a third, every three years there was a poor tithe, a third-year tithe, in which you kept a, a separate tithe in your house, in the town in, where they lived, and when somebody knocked on your door with this poor, you'd have something to give them. So yeah. if you add those three up, you've got probably about the total tithe was really about 23%. Wow. But they yeah, were wow. Given, they were from three like different tax. types of people <laughs> at three different places. Yeah, don't One tell was for Ted the that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> tell them that. <laughs> 23%? Uh, oh, no. You, you're talking about uh, these are from uh, Deuteronomy, I think, Deuteronomy 12. 16, 26 uh, added to. That would be the second and third tithe. And the first tithe is Leviticus 27, 30 to 34, and Numbers 18, 21 to 28. So those, they went to three different people, three different locations, and it's clear that they were three separate tithes to me. A lot of people want to argue about that, though. But, but if there was only one tithe, it's still not biblical. Yeah. yeah. I, I, don't, I don't like getting tied, you know, in a big argument about how many tithes there were. <laughs> yeah, see, uh, so uh, for all our listeners, uh, we'll, we're going to do a recap here. It was tithing ever money. No. There's not one scripture where tithing was ever money. Not the holy Levitical tithes. There are scriptures where tithes of spoils of war might have included money. They had to but pass it was through the fire to be clean. 
this was not a holy tithe. It was not the tithe that was used to support the Levites and the priests. It went into a special fund to, to support the temple. But that was only spoils of war. Uh, I, I refer you to Numbers 31 if you want to read about that. Okay. And uh, the, uh, the tithe, which was food, was brought to the Levites, who were not the pastors of today. <laughs> They yeah. were the janitors and the singers and the workers, and it was brought to them, and they gave a tenth of that uh, to the priest. Yes. Yes. So. And, and that tithe was kept in the Levitical cities where the priests and their families and their kids and their wives lived. It was not brought to the temple. There were 24 families or orders of priests and Levites, and, and, each, and every 24 weeks they would rotate to the temple to minister in the temple one week at a time. So at any given week during the year, you've only got one twenty-fourth of your priests and Levites in the temple ministering. And that's 4%, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, wow. if, you, if, you, if you make the younger kids and the women stay home, it's down to 2%. Yeah. Mm. So you've only got at a maximum 2% of the Levites and the priests at the temple at any given time. So why would God tell you to bring 100% of the tithe to the temple when only 2% of the people, you know, <laughs> the priests were there to eat it, and the other 98%, I want some food to eat, and, and, you know, it's all been taken to the temple, and I live 100 miles from the temple. Well, let's go to the temple every time we get hungry. Yeah. Makes no sense. No, it doesn't make any sense. Now, what no about uh, uh, you, the property? You, you mentioned something about they well, couldn't own any I, I've property. I've got a whole chapter on that in my book on the, the inheritance laws. Yeah. Uh, I think the Bible quotes it about ten different times. It says, I mean, it keeps on saying it, that they have no inheritance in the land, the Levites and the priests. They have no inheritance in the land because I am their inheritance through the tithe. In other words, if you're going to receive the tithe as a Levite or priest, you are not allowed to own property. <laughs> you can't have it both ways. You can't have your cake and uh, eat it, too. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Wow. Now, see, I ain't They're in trouble that. now. I, yeah, I never that. understood what that meant because I, I read it, and I, I was trying to figure out, now, what does that mean? Because it says that you have no inheritance in the land. Chap chapter 6 in my book. Okay. It's on the website. It's in the book. Should the church teach tithing? Chapter 6. Okay. And, they totally uh, ignore that. They have to ignore that because they've got planes and airplanes. You know, oh, I never hear anybody teaching that. I've never heard it explained by no, anybody. Never will from a word of faith Except or anybody that teaches no. tithing. No. They, they, you, have, you can you read have it, to but be you don't biblically ignorant. It. Yes, this they're biblically ignorant. That's what I say. Or, if you're, you're going to be a Bible a, teacher, or, could you please read the Bible? Could you please or read it? it or, yeah. Yeah, so what do you do with these people? Kenneth Copeland, tithing? all of them. Read the Bible, please. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Fred Price, uh, Rod Parsley, could you please read the Bible and uh, uh, find all, out what it all, says? That's all these guys are talking about is money, and the thing about it is, you know, we, we always hear about, you know, you need to get your stuff and everything, but they never talk about the saving grace of Jesus Christ. That's what they need to be talking about, not about getting your stuff and everything, because, you know, the Bible says we brought nothing into this world, and we cannot take anything out. So anything this, out. this great transference of wealth they, that they talk about, I mean, what do you need a transference of wealth for if you're not going to be able to keep it? You know, you can't take it into heaven. You know, I'm, I'm pretty sure heaven is... Heaven will do just fine without our money, you know. I mean, yeah, I'm well, sure it will. God calls it filthy lucre. What does he want it there for? I mean, yeah. really, you know, and we, well, it, it, yeah, it really, you know, it really bothers yeah. me a lot. It, it, it bothers me a lot when I hear this and everything. And usually when you, when you try to uh, do a debate about it, you know, I wrote in, I wrote in the, uh, on the chat page that, uh, you know, that they're, they're not going to debate you. They're, they're not going to debate you because they'll just turn they'll just turn away from you and just say, "Oh, he's preaching heresy," you know, stuff like that. And they talk like if you don't give an offering, sow a seed, or pay a tithe or something like that, that you have. Oh my goodness, you know, there's a section of hell just reserved for you. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's like it's a it's it's part of salvation that you have to give a tithe 
Yeah, it's and part it's of salvation. And nowhere mentioned in the Bible. We didn't have to buy our salvation. We didn't have to pay God off when we, when we asked Jesus into our heart. So why do we have to pay God off? To, he's our Father to yes. uh, provide for us. It's just ridiculous. Well, don't the whole you know, thing is don't you know what Rick Warren says about you must be saved by grace through faith plus tithing? Oh, that my you goodness. can't join his church unless you're a, a sign of covenant to tithe? I mean, this yes. is not what the Bible teaches, salvation by grace through faith plus tithing. But a lot of these churches are doing it now. Mm -hmm. They will not allow you to have any type of ministry position in the church, and I see it on, on TV with some of these preachers, unless you sign a paper uh, saying that you will be a tither. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of people go and they want to hang out with these famous preachers because they want, they're hoping that maybe it will rub off and, and uh, someone will notice them and put them on TV too. But uh, it's, it's a really sad state of affairs. We see the church in such a in, in, in a horrible state, and uh, it's bring really uh, has brought a reproach to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and this to the body of Christ. This doctrine is a reproof on Christianity, and if we don't stop it, it's going to turn Christians in Africa into Muslims. Oh, I know. Yeah. We yeah, are going to lose. Thing has gone over to Africa we are now going too. to lose all of Africa if we don't stop yep. this nonsense. Yeah. That's right. Well, I, I, could you please, Brother Kelly, give your uh, website again to our listeners? Okay, the website is tithing-russkelly.com, R-U-S-S-K-E-L-L-Y. The book is, uh, please look at the book, Should the Church Teach Tithing? Should the church teach tithing? You, it's on Amazon or any internet book site, and uh, it, the whole book is on my website for free. But I, I really would like you to read it because when you read it, mark it. It becomes more personal. <laughs> yes, please do read the book. Please do read the book. Take your Bible out and uh, read his book. He has a Ph.D. on this subject. He spent, I imagine, thousands of hours. Uh, doing the research, so this man knows what he's talking about. If you haven't spent 10 hours or 20 hours studying tithing, then, then you have no debate. You cannot debate it. You have to go read your Bible for yourself. Don't listen to what your pastor is telling you or some TV preacher is telling you. You need to read it. And when you read it and you take the scriptures and you go line by line and verse by verse, you'll see that what we have said here today is the absolute gospel truth. And uh, you can be set free today from the bondage and the fear that you're living in, that if you don't pay God off, somehow you'll be cursed. But That's a big I amen. Ask, <laughs> amen, amen, amen. But I'm going to be really praying for you, Brother Kelly, that you will go back to London and one of these, uh, one of the pastors of uh, some of these major churches there, I would like to see a panel discussion of people and yeah. uh, having that debate on tithing. They should be man yeah. enough to stand up and to uh, be willing to debate you because I know um, after being in London so many times and I, and I hold uh, many of my friends dear in my heart there and I'd like to see them set free from all this bond. Uh, but I want to ask you to please pray for the listeners before we sign off, especially for those that don't know Christ as Savior. Our, our Father, we, we thank you for this time on uh, Susan's show to discuss your word. And, Lord, uh, even though we're, we talked about tithing today, we don't want to forget that the, we're not here to discuss tithing but to lead others to Christ. And I pray, Lord, that, that some, even through this discussion of tithing, they, they realize that your word is true and your word cannot be broken. And if, if we study your word and, and, and see who it's talking to, we we'll realize your your passion for lost souls. Lord, I pray if there's if being any here today that doesn't know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, that you might reach through the, the, the Internet, reach through the telephone, reach, reach any way you can, Lord, and touch that person. Convict them of their, their need for Christ. Convict them of their sin. Lord, help them see how easy it is to be saved, just to say, yeah. I am a sinner. Christ has died for me. I accept his death for me, for me, and Lord, 
be my Lord and Savior, save me. And if they can really pray that prayer, they can claim the promises of your word, that Jesus Christ does keep his word and does save according to his word. Lord, bless Susan and this, this uh, radio uh, evangelism she has. Bless us all that we can always uplift Christ, and we thank you ahead of time for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We thank amen. you, Lord Jesus. We, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to reach out to a lost and dying world. We thank you for what you've done for us. We thank you that you've given us a voice, and we will cry aloud and spare not. We thank you, Lord, for giving us strength and wisdom in everything we do. I want to ask you to bless my brother Vincent, my, my brother Russell, and uh, I thank you for the work that they've done. Continue to bless them, Lord God, and increase them. And uh, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for this time today with the people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. 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 I want to thank you so much, Brother Russell, for being with me today and taking this time out. And uh, thank you, Vincent, for calling in, as usual. I enjoyed you calling in and uh, your radio program on Blog Talk Radio, Black by Color Only. People tune in to his radio program. And don't forget to visit Brother Russell's website, uh, Tithing russellkelly.com and uh, read his Tithing book. Dash Russell, Russ Kelly. Okay. Tithing dash russellkelly.com. Russellkelly.com. Okay. Tithing dash russellkelly.com. And uh, please read his book. You'll be blessed. Thank you, my brothers, for tuning in, uh, for being with me today. And uh, all my listeners, thank you. Tune in again next week, uh, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Blog Talk Radio. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>